So be, before we begin, I just want to introduce um, Aura Aparicio, who is a project coordinator at UCSF Center of Excellence for Immigrant Child Health and Wellbeing, uh, who will be also uh, introducing us to Dr. Noriega for today's presentation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Catherine. Good morning. Um, once again, my name is Aura Aparicio, and I'm with the Center of Excellence for Immigrant Child Health and Wellbeing at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospitals. We are a cross bay entity whose mission is to establish an inclusive community that provides leadership and guidance towards the promotion of optimal health and well being of immigrant children. The work of our center sits on three pillars clinical services, education, and advocacy. In 2021, we launched a pediatric asylum clinic, providing medical and psychological forensic exams to support children and youth petitioning for asylum. In addition, we're also training the next generation of providers with an immigrant-focused health curriculum. The center's invested in the mental health and wellness of immigrant children, youth, and families, and we are so grateful to be partnering again with First Five Alameda County to offer these events. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today, Dr. Monica Alejandra Noriega. Dr. Noriega is a licensed clinical psychologist and assistant clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco, CTRP, a Child Trauma Research Program. Dr. Noriega specializes in the assessment and treatment of complex trauma among children ages zero to five and pregnant persons in community mental health and primary care settings. In her clinical role, Dr. Noriega provides child parent psychotherapy, perinatal child parent psychotherapy, and infant mental health consultation at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Dr. Noriega also offers trainings, workshops, consultation, capacity building, and curriculum development to community-based social service agencies. And the Center of Excellence is also fortunate to count on Dr. Noriega's expertise as she also forms part of our pediatric asylum clinic team. Welcome, Dr. Noriega. Thank you, Aura. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Catherine, for the warm welcome, the generous invitation. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, before I start sharing my screen and jumping into today's content, I want to just invite us all to get comfortable in our seats, give ourselves some gratitude for arriving here this morning, for everything you had to do to be able to be present in this training today. And if we could just start today by taking a deep breath in through our nose and out through our mouth. One more time like that. Take a deep breath in through your nose. And exhale slowly through your mouth. Make any movements you need to make. Drink water. Take another sip of your coffee or your tea. You are where you're supposed to be. Please resource yourself as you need throughout the rest of this morning. Um, and now we will begin. Can everyone see my screen okay? Okay. So um, today, we will, I'm really excited to share with you all um, a training that is near and dear to my heart, the Ghost in the Frontera where we will talk about how we can integrate our work as trauma healers with our, our views and our um, possibilities as also being migrant justice activists. And how do we do this during the perinatal period? And once again, I'm Monica Noriega. Um, just a quick disclosure, I don't have any conflicts of interest um, and any views that I express today, and I have many, whether they are personal or sociopolitical, they are my own and don't reflect any of the places that I work or anyone sp sponsoring this training. Um, and I also want to um, say up front that we're talking about birthing bodies today. Sometimes you might hear me say mothers or women, um, and I do my best to be inclusive of all birthing bodies that may not be, um, that may not identify as women, not all birthing bodies uh, might identify as women. Um, so I invite you to um, have some grace with me as I kind of code switch between those those different um, terms and um, and also invite you to call me in if I do misspeak. Um, so thank you. So here's our agenda for today. Um, we're going to start with a check-in 
Um, I think it's good, especially in these spaces. When we are working in the same county that we have time to build relationships, maybe with someone that you don't know. Um, so you will be sent into a breakout room with a random other person. If that person isn't talking back to you, come on back to the main room and we can talk together. Um, and then we will go over our core concepts for today, which are the basics of perinatal mental health, the core developmental anxieties of the perinatal period, and the stages of immigration trauma. And then uh, we will talk about what is the ghost in the borderlands and the ways that those core fears are exacerbated by the lived experiences of migrant people um, as they um, traverse multiple borders and militarized borders. I'll share a case example with all of you that is near and dear to my heart that we can think about together. Um, and hopefully at the end of this, we'll have time to talk about strategies for collective healing, both during the perinatal period and beyond. And before we go further, I also want to say that uh, my philosophy in these spaces is that everyone here is a teacher. Everyone here has something to teach us, um, and everyone here has something that we can learn from. So I want to encourage everyone to tap into, lean into your sources of wisdom, um, and um, and feel open to share to sharing what what comes up for you either in the chat or um, or coming off mute. I hope this can be a conversation. So here's our chicken. Um, and I want us to ask ourselves and each other, what are the conditions, the material, the spiritual, the somatic conditions of the land in your community? How is the land? What are the conditions of the land right now? The lands that we're standing on. What are the conditions of the spirit in your community? How does it feel to go through your community? What is the spirit of your community? And what are the conditions of the birthing bodies and the babies in your community? Just reflect, give yourself time to pause and notice what are those conditions and share with one another because different people might notice different things. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing and I will put those questions in the chat and we will open up the breakout groups. Any questions? What are the conditions of the land, conditions of the spirit, conditions of the birthing bodies and the babies? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna open up the breakout rooms. And we'll have five minutes. So not that much time, but enough time to at least start the reflection. Love to see people using every last second. That leads me to believe that there were connections being made. Welcome back, everyone. I know that went by really fast. Um, and I would like to invite anyone, if you'd like to share your reflections on the conditions of the land, the spirit, the bodies, the birthing bodies. Any reflections or offerings anyone would like to make to the large group? Orlando? Our reflection was Lawrence Livermore Lab of Science. How the pollution toxic gets to Oakland. One of our uh, fellows on there works at Children's Hospital, so they knew a lot. We have another person on that group with very forms on what's the makeup of the racial here. You know, we might say whites, blacks, Latinos, but it, it only exists in America. White is just a figment of the imagination because you can be from Poland, German, this, so you can't say white. You can't say this is a Hispanic or immigrant issue. I might be Latino X, I might be from, you know, uh, Latin America, Southern America. So I think that we just use one human race when it comes to this issue, or African Americans, or if you're black, or if you're a Negro, or et cetera. How can we just make it one human race and help to cross all? Mm. Mm. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you for that offering. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Any other offerings? Aurora? Hello, everyone. Yes. So in our group, um, we were a little bit like 
I'm going to be honest, right? I'm like uh, a little bit confused about the questions, you know, um, but we, we got, we got through it and um, the, um, okay, let me go back to the questions <laughs> again. Uh, okay. So the conditions of the land, uh, the community. So there was a lot of share about, you know, the violence going on, especially in the Oakland. I'm from San Mateo County and there's just been so many, um, you know, robberies and things like that. And so there's a lot of violence going on, as you know, and, um, and again, it has to do with um, the poor, the moderate, the social economic, again, that, that we're experiencing in these communities. Um, and there's, you know, and, and please, my group, if, if you guys want to um, share, in, in, you know, jump in at any time and the, for the spiritual um, conditions of the community, again, you know, it, it's, it's tense, it, it's scary, um, and it has shifted to so all these years, right? And so, um, and then for the uh, conditions of the burden of the families, again, it goes back to, um, you know, the poor, the moderate, what are the services are there for these families? And if, you know, housing is a big issue right now. Um, and so they say, yes, we have these, you know, uh, complexes that are going to be for low income when at the end they don't qualify. So again, it's, it's just, um, there's a lot of, um, tense and, and, and yeah. So, and, and again, that doesn't mean that when we need to come together as a community, we will come together. Right. But again, it's all this division, right. That's going on. So, yeah. Mm. That was well, great. thank you for those reflections, Aurora and Orlando. Um, I think hopefully we can see that these things are all interconnected, right? The conditions of the land, the conditions of the spirit, and the conditions of the birthing bodies and the babies. Um, and so with that said, let's let's build, keep, keep building on this foundation that we're building together um, about the intricacies, these connections. Um, and so our intentions as we move through the rest of this morning, um, hopefully by the end of this, you can identify some of the core fears that we can expect to come up during pregnancy in the first five years of life. Hopefully we can also identify the parallels between the stages of immigration trauma and the stages of development that occur during the perinatal period, right? So like, what do they have in common? How are these, these things related? And how can I keep that in mind when I work with families that might have histories of migration trauma and how does that impact maybe how they carry their babies and their relationship to their babies? Um, and finally, hopefully we can leave here today um, with an exchange of dyadic and collective healing strategies. I have some to offer. I also want to hear the ones you all have to offer. And I want to start us off with um, this brilliant quote by Patricia Gonzalez. And she says that birth is a ceremony of a life way that is primary in reaffirming people's relationship to each other to their environment and to all of creation and to themselves, right? Um, and Patricia Gonzalez is an indigenous scholar um, who really talks about how the perinatal period and the process of birth is so intricately, intricately connected to indigenous worldview and how all things are connected. So that's why we started off today talking about these connections with the land and the body. And something that's gonna guide us through today is what I call the regenerative principle. It also comes from, um, indigenous scholars, indigenous wisdom that says that um, all material, all energy, everything that exists in our worlds and our communities is reorganized and reorganized according to the social, material, mental, and spiritual way of existence. And it's presented as a living framework for understanding the human body. So the regenerative process means that all of this energy, everything that happens from spending from birth to death is not wasted. Everything that we experience, everything that we come across is then composted and then recreated and used for something else in the future, right? Um, nothing ceases to exist. Everything's constantly in a process of being born and reborn, right? This duality of life and death, um, this balance of light and shadow. So I say this because we're talking about such a sensitive period, right? The perinatal period, pregnancy. And we're also talking about forces that... Um, that generate a lot of harm and a lot of death. So how do we hold this duality of life and death as we move through this conversation? And many people say that the perinatal period or the period of pregnancy 
is when the life force and the death force are coming to the surface. It is a period of immense vitality and immense fear of losing life. In the process of creating life, we are also losing life. Within um, the female body or female identified bodies and organs, at the same time that we create eggs and we prepare to create life, also other things are being shed and are being lost, right? So life is constantly in a process of duality between creating life and making space for new life. So there's a, there's a duality of life and death that occurs during this period. And I say this because it's also important that we understand that pregnancy in the process of giving birth can often be one of the most dangerous times in a birthing body's life and in a woman's life. And I use that term, that term lightly because not all people that birth identify as women. Um, the lifetime risk of maternal death across the world varies drastically. So I just want you all to notice here that in Western Europe, the what lifetime, the risk of maternal mortality is one in every 11,000. And this was data just from this year. Whereas in places um, across the African continent, across Latin America, the rates are much, much higher, like one in 27, one in 320. What do we make of this? What do folks notice about this, this chart? Why do we think it is that maternal mortality is so much higher in certain parts of the world and, and not quite as high in others? Access to health care. Access to health care. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Can I make a comment? Mm -hmm. uh, what immediately comes to mind is, as you were mentioning that, you know, it's... um. Uh, maybe once Western medicine and the technology that is available compared to spiritual practices where everything is more natural and connected to the gods. Mm -hmm. So I do, that was, that's what's come to mind immediately as we're talking about medicine and the difference and what's accessible for these communities. Mm -hmm. And difference in worldview, right? Difference in what, what life means, what medicine means. Another thing that comes to mind for me, and I, I love these, these reflections, and we always get different ones when we look at data, right? Data can help us create different insights. But when I look at this, I think about why is it that the parts of the world that have the longest history of colonization, the longest history of ravaging violence due to chattel slavery, due to attempted genocide of indigenous people have higher rates of maternal mortality in 2023 than the countries that have histories of being the colonizers. Um, and so all that to say that history matters. History matters. The, those legacies of violence have an impact to this day on the land, on the spirit, and on the birthing bodies in the babies. Yeah, there's a connection. And all those things impact healthcare, impact access. How connected can we be to our ancestral medicines and ancestral ways of healing and connecting? Um, and so it's important for us to grapple with these things. And in the United States alone, this is probably not new information to anyone. And I also want to take in feedback from our Black colleagues that we shouldn't talk about Black death or Black birthing death. We are not also talking about and supporting Black life. So let's let's just name that here as well. Um, and at the same time, I think it's important that we grapple with the, the reality that Black women in this country, especially after the pandemic or in the, in the throes of the pandemic, had higher rates of maternal mortality um, than non-Hispanic white women. Um, and so we see these same legacies, right, replicated in our country. What happens on a global scale is replicated at a smaller scale in our local in our locales. And more than 80% of pregnancy-related deaths in the United States um, were preventable, according to data between 2017 and 2019, according to the Maternal Mortality Review Committees. Um, and so looking at this chart. You will see, and this is this is one study that was done by by the CDC, that the leading cause of those deaths, those eighty percent of those deaths that were preventable, were due to mental health conditions. Eighty percent of all those deaths are preventable, and thirty percent of all of those deaths are due to mental health conditions. And more than half, so over fifty three percent of pregnancy related deaths happen up to one year after delivery. So it's not just after that you have the baby that you're safe, but it's actually the first year postpartum that actually actually turns out to be the most dangerous and the most vulnerable, right? So the majority of those mortalities happen between seven days to one year after pregnancy um, 
or during delivery or within seven days after is only about counts for about 25% of those deaths, right? Um, any thoughts or reactions to this, to this information? Is this new? Is this reaching to the choir? It can be quite jarring. What is it about the, the, the vulnerability, right? The duality of life and death in this period that is supposed to be about giving life. And all of these things hopefully can draw to the conclusion that perinatal mental health, caring for the mental health of birthing bodies is important, but it cannot be done in an isolated way. Perinatal mental health is infant mental health. It is maternal mental health. It is paternal mental health. It is family mental health. And it is also community mental health. It is not enough to only focus on the baby or the, or the birthing person themselves, but how can we resource the entire community to address these realities, right? Address this duality between life and death. And taking all those external factors, that those external material conditions into reality, now let's take a look inward. Um, the process of um, perinatal mental health work is much about turning inward and supporting the birthing person with their emerging maternal identity. Even if this is your third or fourth child, the process of being becoming a mother to this baby is one that requires a lot of energy, a lot of integrating work, a lot of resolving or attempting to look differently at conflicts. Um, and I recognize this language is very gendered. I do apologize for that. Um, Daniel Stern back in the 90s wrote about um, the motherhood constellation and the emergence of the maternal identity. And that when um, during the perinatal period, there are multiple conversations that are happening internally. There is a dialogue with herself as a daughter, how she was, how her experience of being a daughter and as a mother. There is the dialogue with the baby that is on the way and that relationship that is now being born. And then there is a dialogue that is a little more ancestral. It is a dialogue with the maternal grandmother, with the ancestors processing childhood and body, bodily memories of infancy and birth and memories of interactions with the birth mother. Because just as your body is remembering what it, what it was like to be an infant, your body is also trying to connect to the ancestral memories of what it means to mother and what it means to survive in these material conditions as a mother. And this is when, um, as mental health providers, we think critically about what are the patterns? What is the unmetabolized, the unprocessed affect, the unmetabolized, unprocessed feelings, body memories that might come up for a person during this period? Um, Selma Freiberg, our, our esteemed um, foremother of the field of infant mental health, taught us that unmetabolized affect, unmetabolized fears, from a caregiver's past that are not able to be connected to experience are more likely to be repeated onto the next generations. And so what happens when you have an entire people that have the unmetabolized, unprocessed fears of the community that they came from, of not just their mothers, but the people that we come from and what has happened to our people? And all of these things are completely understandable and expect expectable. None of these things are pathology. None of these things would amount to a mental health disorder. This is, this is an expectable process or fear I would expect any birthing person, any mother to grapple with across the lifespan, not just when you're pregnant, but especially when you're pregnant. Um, and there are certain developmental anxieties that are necessary and expected during the perinatal period because the process of being pregnant and preparing to bring another life into this world, when the conditions of the land, the spirit and the other birthing bodies around you are suffering, it's understandable that we will have these fears, these concerns, but what is it, how do we create a society? How do we create a culture where those fears and those anxieties can be held, can be named and are not shamed or blamed? Um, so some of these normative anxieties during this period of immense disequilibrium is the uncertainty of survival. That is expectable. This fear of death, will I survive? Will my baby survive? Will we survive the birth? What's gonna happen after birth? It's a common fear. The other common anxiety or developmental fear 
comes with the transition that comes and the disequilibrium that comes with these identity and role transitions. Even if this is your third or your fourth or fifth baby, you're now transitioning from the daughter of or to the mother of this baby. Um, but especially if it might be your first baby, that transition from being the daughter of to now the mother can bring up a lot of anxieties and fears because all of us, all of our bodies have core memories of what it's like to be mothered or not mothered. Trauma is not just what happens to you, but it's also what doesn't happen to you that should happen. Yeah. Um, and even though these anxieties are completely normative and expectable, um, it's also important for us to think about what has happened to this person that might exacerbate these anxieties. And if unattended to, how might these anxieties, if they are left unmetabolized, unprocessed, unseen, unheard, might they then devolve into what could be pathology, what could be a true mental health disorder? And of those, there are many um, in the perinatal period, but we won't talk about those that much today. Oh, wrong way. The other developmental anxiety for us to keep in mind is the reemergence of deeply embedded psychological processes. Again, completely understandable that those unresolved conflicts, those unresolved traumas from the past stemming from the preverbal period, so back before your body had words to understand what was happening around you, might be re-remembered or experienced in the body in unregulated ways. Um, we now have data to confirm that babies do remember and form memories of being in the womb. Um, that being in the womb is actually a time when our nervous systems are developing. Um, and for a lot of uh, pregnant people, we can expect that maybe your body might also be remembering what it was like to be in your mother's womb, whether at a somatic or intrapsychic level. And how might those unresolved conflicts or traumas come up um, during the perinatal period? And all of these things taken together will have, will manifest in the way that the caregiver or the birthing person develops the relationship to their baby, right? This baby that is on the way. Um, attributions is a, a fancy term that we use in parenting and infant mental health to talk about beliefs that we have about the baby. Baby's not here yet, right? They're here, they exist, right? But we're starting to, to develop a relationship with to them and with them and an idea, a fantasy about who they are and who they might be, yeah? And this isn't just for the birthing person, this is for everyone that surrounds that baby, right? We all develop these beliefs about the baby. Um, they And these are, we call them attributions because that baby can't talk or show us anything about themselves. It's all about what we put on them, right? Or what you might feel about them. Um, and these things are all formed by, and again, this is very gendered language, um, by the fantasies, the fears, the conflicts, also the love and the hope and the wishes that we might have for that baby, right? Um, and these things are often based on the attachment style of the mother, right? The experiences that she had, how much were her needs responded to in the past, um, and also what is going on in the community, right? What are the conditions of the land and the birthing bodies around her that might impact how what we attribute to this baby? And so I love quotes, and I have one here from um, our dear mentor, colleague, one of my greatest teachers, Alicia Lieberman, and she says that babies mean a lot to their parents. They are the recipients of all of the best of themselves and all the dreams they have yet to realize in their own lives. But this emotional investment gives rise to positive attributions that engender joy and reciprocity in the parent-child relationship. So some attributions are positive, right? Um, it could be that like, I remember I, I would work with, I worked with um, families in the NICU and I had a dad um, who was um, visiting his baby and he said, oh, he's going to be a little futbolero just like me. We come from a long line of athletes and that he's going to go and be a campeon. And we were so excited, right? That's a positive attribute. He has hopes and dreams for his baby, but those hopes and dreams didn't quite match the reality of the fact that his baby was born at 25 weeks and was born with underdeveloped lungs and likely would struggle a little bit in the first years of life to develop the motor skills and the body skills, the coordination skills in order to be a great athlete. And so what happens when the hopes and the dreams and the attributions that might be as good intentioned as they are don't match who that baby really is? And this photo that I have here is of um, the encampment in Matamoros, Mexico um, of a little girl holding her baby doll. So even as children, 
um, for those of us that engage in pretend play, we might even make attributions of our future babies that aren't even here yet. But babies can also, as Alicia says, become vessels for a parent's most painful headed fears and impulses as the child then becomes a representation of all of the repressed and disowned parts of that parent's identity. So those negative attributions often begin during pregnancy, often way before, and then they change and deepen once the imaginary baby becomes a real baby after they arrive after birth. Um, so negative attributions are kind of the other side of the spectrum. And these are things that we might see in instances of domestic violence, where I have had um, cases where I'll work with a pregnant person who the baby might have been the result, or the pregnancy might have been the result of an unwanted sexual contact. And every movement that baby makes reminds them of that violence. And so you might hear comments like, they're violent like their dad, you're aggressive like your dad, um, you're going to be, you know, Nessia, like your grandmother or like so-and-so. Um, and so then the, be the baby, right, just doing what it does, growing in the womb, becomes a container for all of that unmetabolized, unseen, unheard cries of this mother, of this birthing person. And all of us, have anxieties and fears that are then exacerbated during periods of immense psychological disequilibrium. So all of these attributions that we're talking about are loaded with fears that may or may not have been responded to or held by the community and the people that surrounded that birthing person. Um, and so when we hear an attribution that might be, oh, well, they're aggressive like their dad, or you're going to be like, you're gonna be a soccer player like me. Could it be that the, that we're actually communicating that I'm afraid of separateness? I'm afraid that you might leave me. Um, and to go give a kind of an overview of what these anxieties are, all of us, all humans, and this is, comes from like psychoanalytic thought. I cited Alicia Lieberman here, but they come from a long line of psychoanalytic um, and psychodynamic thought that helps us understand how early experiences impact the internal world, the way that we organize our thoughts and the views that we develop about ourselves, others in the world and how we navigate relationships. Um, and so here you'll see we have the fear of separation or the fear of abandonment that is especially heightened between eight to 24 months because what are babies learning to do during that period? Any thoughts? What is baby learning how to do between eight to 24 months? A lot of things. Differentiating and walking. Differentiating and walking, yes. And trust, absolutely. And so if I walk and I toddle my way over here and I turn around and you're not there, it might actually be tragic to me that you're not there because I depend on you for life itself. It is scary to be separated at that age. And yet it is an anxiety that all of us have to face because we are separate in many ways. And we have to learn to cope with that anxiety. Um, that separateness. There's also the fear of losing love between 18 to 36 months because what is a toddler's favorite word? No. Oh. <laughs> Mine. Right? You're asserting your autonomy. I have beliefs and thoughts and wants that are completely different than yours. And I'm going to let you know what they are. And if I don't get it, I'm going to my throw myself on the floor. But there's also at that same time, the developing capacity cognitively to understand that there are rules and there are expectations of me out in these streets that is different than when I'm in my house. And if I don't behave accordingly, or if I assert mine or, or no, will you still love me? Am I still lovable? Am I still worthy? Or is it that, jumping ahead, that there's something so bad in me that I'm being punished. It's not just that I did something bad, but is it that I'm actually a bad boy or I'm actually a bad girl? And if we think about it in our communities, this fear of being bad, I know I skipped over body damage, I'll come back to that. This fear of being bad is oftentimes not just a fear that exists in the parent-child relationship, but a fear that is very real in our community. Because what does our community, what does our society do to people that are bad?
We lock them in cages. We isolate them from the rest of our community. We punish them. If you are bad, you, you cannot be close to me. Badness is over there. Yeah. Um, and then finally, we have the fear of body damage going back a little bit, um, which is a, a common fear, a fear that all of us have. Nobody likes your body being harmed or hurt, um, especially between 12, between 12 to 36 months. We don't have the best depth perception. We don't have the best risk perception. Injuries are going to happen. The first year of life, especially, um, is the most prone for injuries. Um, but what? How does how does the world? How do people around me respond to my pain? And when people when we are hurt, right? So the ways that these fears are and are not responded to, not just within the parent-child relationship, not just within the family, but by the culture, by the society that we're living in, plays a big role in the beliefs, in the stories, in the fantasies we tell ourselves about ourselves and also about the babies. And going back to the fear of being bad, just driving this point home, the parent-child relationship exists within the context of the family relationship that exists within the context of the community. So what happens when you have an entire community where your community has been told that you are bad, your people are bad, your people are not welcome or not worthy? And how do those echoes, how do those messages then seep down into the attributions, the relationships that we develop to the people, to the next generation? And susto, I want to give a word about susto, is a word that we talk about in our in a lot of different Latinx communities. Susto is another word for fear. And our indigenous healers and indigenous scholars tell us that susto happens when a pregnant woman, um, and it often happens to two people, and that the susto of the baby, so the susto of the mother is not just the susto of the mother, the fear of the mother, the unmetabolized fears of the mother is not just her fear, but it's actually a double fear for the baby. So not only does the baby have its own susto in reaction to what's happening around it, but it also has the mother's susto, right? So both of like the baby's internal individual experience and the mother's experience are being held in the same place. And this susto can happen prior to and during birth. And so what I think Patricia is trying to teach us here is that what happens to the pregnant person, to birthing bodies, what happens around them does not just give susto to the pregnant person that gets passed on, but that the baby has their, has its own susto, has its own experience of what is happening and their own memory of what is happening, but they also have to carry that of their mother and that of their people. And I think a lot of us that um, are building our awareness and doing our work around intergenerational trauma can relate to that, that our body holds those memories. And so here we have Kind of again trying to drive these points home i think a lot of the times when we think about um talk about trauma and we go to trainings about trauma it is really important that we we acknowledge what has happened to the child what are the adverse childhood experiences the experiences of abuse neglect household dysfunction that have happened to the child um, and how do those things then impact their health and the expectations right the beliefs they develop about about themselves and others across the lifespan but what often gets left out of the equation is what has happened to the community? What are the adverse or rather violent community experiences that then impact the expectations we have about others and ourselves that then lead to an increased likelihood of adverse or traumatic childhood experiences, right? We, I think it's important that maybe we start from the outside in rather than the inside out, right? And to put this concept in another way, many of the families that we work with um, come to us or we are acutely aware, especially in the context of immigration and immigration trauma, which we'll talk about in a second, that the conditions of state-sanctioned family separations, of mass incarceration, of femicide, of state-sponsored violence, addictions, and all the other forms of violence are what the families with the community is coming to us for help with. We ourselves are searching for answers, for healing, from these experiences. But could it be that these conditions are really reflections of or colluding with the fears of being bad, the fear of bodily harm, 
the fear of separation, the fear of losing love. And what happens when our bodies then adapt to those fears being confirmed, where the very systems in our brain, like the reticular activating system that controls how we metabolize and regulate and express our emotions across the lifespan is then adjusted. So we can be more responsive to the threats to our lives, um, to the threats in our environment. But more importantly, if we don't take our eyes beyond the things that confirm these fears and don't mean that these are actually rooted in legacies of white supremacy, of gender-based violence, ongoing attempted colonization, and intergenerational poverty, we would be remiss. And I love this quote by Naira Waqid where she says that all the women in me are tired. So this is not just the story of us and our people, or our grandmothers, our great grandmothers, but of all of the birthing bodies that have come before us across all um, gender expressions. And white supremacy is a project of fear and disconnect, according to Temo Okun. Shout out to Temo Okun for doing this work around white supremacy culture. And when we link, when we look at the parallels between white supremacy culture and how trauma manifests, a common manifestation of trauma is this experience of fragmentation or internal disorganization. We drop a vase, all of the pieces of the vase are still there, but they're all out of order. They're all jumbled up. It doesn't make sense anymore. Another thing that trauma does is it causes us to isolate. We might see a lot of social isolation as a trauma response. That is an understandable reaction to a real or perceived threat to our lives or our livelihood. But disconnection and displacement at a massive at a massive scale, at a global scale, are tools of institutionalized oppression. But you can see how these two might be confusing, or one might be mistaken for the other. This is a very overwhelming uh, image, and um, those are not sperms; they are seeds. They used to be green, but I changed the color. Um, I just want folks to take a minute and just take this in. This is um, an image that was created by Susan Raffo and Owen Marciano. And it, I think, outlines really beautifully exactly what we're talking about here, about how, how disconnection and fragmentation due to trauma and also due to systematic oppression leads to a culture of disconnect and displacement. So all of us, I think, at some point can identify um, coming from an intact in culture. And then there is a threat. And this leads to a whole host of reactions that happen not at an individual level, but at a cultural collective level. Um, and that leads to community members in distress, elders and caregivers that cannot attune to community members' needs because they themselves are in survival mode. And then that leads to unmet developmental needs across generations. Notice that I said developmental needs, so needs that we all have. All of us have the developmental need for those fears and anxieties to be held and seen and responded to, right? That doesn't change about the human condition. And then that, according to this image, and this is just one interpretation, you might have your own, can contribute to that loss of attachment to kin, to group, to land, to spirit, that sense of isolation and that sense of displacement. And then we have a generation of people that are isolated. The message is that I am on my own. We are alone. There is no togetherness. And that leads to an entire people living in a state of freeze and disconnection, separateness. I'm gonna pause there because that was a, a lot of information. Um, any thoughts or questions, comments of these connections we're making together about these core fears, how they are exacerbated at a massive scale, how they are replicated across generations, across communities? Are y'all with me? I'll stop sharing for a second. Just wanna pause, just pause. Comments, thoughts, connections. Maybe examples. No pressure to share at all. Just want to like give give some spaciousness. One of the fears. I'm having a little trouble hearing you, Orlando, but I heard I heard most of it. Uh, 
I hope others got to hear you better. Oh, I was basically saying uh, if one of the mothers got raped or something and they had the baby and the baby inside, the mother might have a fear that the child might come and be a rapist or abusive or yep. you know, psychologically. Uh, what others think or saying about the child, you know, as her being pregnant, that fear and anxiety can kick in also and make it a stressful uh, prenatal labor to die on, you know, in that stigma. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, thank you for, for bringing that point. Um, those lived experiences, right, can contribute to real fears, right? Uh, Diana? I think I'm just reflecting upon, uh, you know, how everything is interconnected and it's really important to know our history, but also, I guess, also part of the privilege that we have when connecting with families and maybe not being a role of a teacher, but definitely being informed and being aware of how we show up in this space. But at the same time, I think it's important for a community to, as you say, remember all this, you know, in a way being able to keep this in mind and that, you know, mothers not, are not only carrying their babies, but also the the history of their culture, the history of the their migration journey. So I think it's it's um now I'm reflecting uh, as a provider, you know how we how we put this into the space, you know, and and start these conversations because I think when we are, you know, parents always come in and trying to be a better version of themselves, but you know what do you really know yourself, your culture? You know that that's that's what comes to mind in a way. So mm -hmm. thank you for 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 this reflection. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Liana, and I'm so glad you said that that piece about the birthing person is also carrying all these other legacies, but where do all those feelings go? Where does all that metabolized hurt go? And one thing that I didn't say earlier about the slide of um, Selma Freiberg's Ghost in the Nursery, I think I did say it, but I'm gonna repeat it, is that the theory is in the field of infant and perinatal mental health is that that affect has to be sent back to that experience. We have to connect it back to the experience to make it less likely that when it comes up, we don't know what to do with it. We don't recognize it. It's gonna come up, but can we can we recognize it? Can we locate it? Can we welcome it? Or um, and when, and when the conditions allow us to do that, right? So we'll, we'll talk more about, about that in a, in a minute, but, um, but I think that you're asking the right question is what do we do with this affect? What do we do with some metabolized fear? Because um, it can feel really heavy. Yeah. Any other reflections, thoughts, comments? All right. Well, we're going to keep going then. I appreciate all of your reflections, your attention. Um, feel free to stop me, slow me down at any point. Um, and as we transition, so now that we have that all that out of the way, that conversation about these core fears, how these things work, how they manifest the perinatal period. Now let's layer on the community that I am dedicating my career to, my community, um, uh, communities of people that have had to flee their homelands or that have been displaced from their homelands um, and how these fears are exacerbated or might manifest under those conditions. Um, and Naira Wahid says, I, I have a lot of her, her poems because I think they're great, that my mother was my first country, the first place I ever lived. Mi madre fue mi primer país, el prim primer lugar en el que viví. And so when we think about the process of migration, not, I wanna say first, not all migration is traumatic or has to be traumatic, but all migration does cause immense psychological disequilibrium in the same way that pregnancy or a transition, a huge identity transition does. Um, there are a lot of things you can learn about and read about about um, duelo migratorio or uh, migration grief that is expected anytime someone is displaced or has to leave their homelands. But migration trauma specifically, the process of migration that is traumatic, happens, we think, in a series of four stages, at least. The first stage is the pre-migration traumas. So what were the things that happened that pushed somebody out? What were the things that happened before you left that may have colluded with those fears, 
that may have set the stage, right, for um, for changes in how you see yourself and others in the world. Um, and then also all processes of migration and especially in immigration trauma is also a story about fear of separation um, and, se and separation from the land, from spirit and from kin and kinship. We th wanna think about in the pre-migration period, what were the pre-separation experiences? So how were your relationships to your people before you had to leave? Were they safe? Were they not so safe? Did you feel held and seen? Were you exposed to violence? Where, what developmental stage was that person at before they had to leave, right? So the stage of your development is really important. All of them have different implications, but it helps us have a clear picture about what was the conditions, what were the conditions of that person and the people around them before they had to leave. Then we have the in-transit stage. And so those are all the things that happen in Camino along the way. And we know, especially um, for our people that might be coming from the Caribbean, um, Central America, and especially from South America and the African continents, that the journey is actually one of the most dangerous times. It is a period where you're most likely to experience violence and you're most likely to experience sexual assault. Um, and it can often be a time of immense inability to tolerate uncertainty of where will I, will I get my meal next? Where am we going to sleep? I mean, my children going to be okay. And it's often during this period that we want to think about if there were separations that happened along the way, what were the circumstances of them? Was it that we made a decision and someone had to go back? Was it chosen or was it not chosen? Was it expected or unexpected? And who made the choice? Was it the person? Was it a government entity? Was it an organized crime group? Right? What were the circumstances? Who got to make the choice? And then we have the third stage of uh, what we call the, it could be asylum seeking or temporary resettlement stage. And so this is the stage where folks come face to face with um, the immigration industrial complex, as we like to call it, with any form of militarized borders, government officials, law enforcement officials, uh, and you're coming face to face with these systems, right? With all of your vulnerability, all of your hopes, all of your asks. And then the last stage, and this is the stage that really does not have an end, but is the post-migration stage um, where the ongoing traumatization continues. And we can expect that even post-migration, after you might arrive to your destination, that there will be kind of a period of overcompensation when you're still in fight or flight mode, you're still trying to get settled, you got to get everything done, you haven't quite landed yet. It's not safe to land yet. And we also know that especially the first couple of years in a new country can often be um, one of the most stressful times of uncertainty and resettlement, um, even under the most ideal of circumstances. And then after so much time in an overcompensation stage, the similar way that we think about a trauma traumatic response, then we see a period of decompensation, right? This is where we might see high rates of depression, of isolation, anxiety, because um, our bodies can only be in that flight or fight or freeze mode for so long, right? Until we eventually have to come back down. Um, but this is where we might see a lot of um, challenges with our mental health. And it's through that process that we also see high rates of conflict across generations. So especially for families that may have be maybe reunited for the first time after many years of being separated um, or may um, or may have um, may have other separations that occurred along the way. Conflict across generations, especially in the post-migration phase, is an expected, understandable part of this process. But it's that transgenerational conflict that grappling with that unmetabolized affect of who was left and who left and who is here now, and what version of you is here now, um, all of those conflicts kind of come to light. Um, and we wanna think about those legacies of post-separation and reunification in all of their forms. And so giving some information, right, about the state of immigration just this past month, right? So what is what does migration really look like right now? And I'm going to focus on our southern border. Migration happens all over this country and on all of our borders. 
Um, but since this is the population that um, that I um, work with and identify with, this is who we're going to focus on today. Um, right now, migration continues to grow, being at an all-time high. And notice that this is Mexico's appreh apprehensions of all migrants. So while apprehensions at the U.S.-Mexico border might be going down, apprehensions at other borders of people trying to get here are going way up. So just in July of 2023, we saw almost um, 73,000 apprehensions. So that's by Mexico, right? People trying to get up to the northern border. Um, also, the apprehensions um, down in Costa Rica, in Panama, of people trying to go through the Darien Gap, mostly from Venezuela, is also right now at, at an all-time high. And just a little bit about the state of immigration, right? The conditions of immigration um, right now um, under the Biden administration um, began during the Trump administration that there was an all-out ban on asylum. It used to be called Title 42, which was also known as the Remain in Mexico program um, or um, the Migrant Protections Protocols. That um, program ended, but now it has been replaced um, with a new process that is managed by an app called CBP-1. And the reason I know all this is because I do volunteer work at the border. Um, and ever since Biden rolled out, this new ban on asylum and this new way of applying for asylum is through this app and getting appointments. Um, has actually led to what we call um, to what we call virtual kind of gatekeeping. And so the problems with this app is that um, this app is what they, although they propose it as something that would be more equitable and more just and more orderly, has actually perpetuated the same racial biases, the same forms of violence that were happening when folks just presented their bodies at a port of entry. Um, so I will say that asylum is an international human right. Um, but under the past two administrations, it had us effectively, effectively ended at our southern borders. And this CBP-1 app um, has had many issues. There was a time where um, to use the app, you have to take a picture of yourself and all of your children, like a selfie. So you have to have a smartphone. Um, and um, then if you do get a smartphone and you can upload the picture, there was a period where the app literally did not recognize Black babies' faces. I, and I say this is this is a reality. You you can look it up. There was a there's been many articles written on it, but the CBP one app did not recognize black babies' faces. It would only recognize some black adult faces. And so what would happen was black families from a lot of them from Haiti, from different parts of the African diaspora and the Caribbean and South America would try to make an appointment. So they can cross legally through a, a port of entry, fleeing violence, right? These are people fleeing violence on their lives were not able to make an appointment for their entire family. So they had to choose. Do I make an appointment for myself, knowing that my baby is an included in the appointment, or do I not? And ever since, and now that bug supposedly has been fixed, but the damage has been done, right? Um, and the Department of Homeland Security director told reporters just this month, on August 17th, just last week, um, or last week, a couple of weeks ago, uh, that they've now deported more than 145,000 people thanks to this app, thanks to this new process since May 12th, right? And I hope you're alarmed and outraged by this by this reality because I am too. Um, and I also want us to think about as we're having this conversation about these core fears and they are exacerbated by the conditions that we find ourselves living in, the systems of oppression we find ourselves living in that are then perpetuated by these processes. What is the message that that sends? And interestingly, the people that are most impacted are the birthing bodies and the babies. And just this month as well, um, there were about 32,743 people. This was just on one day, on August 27th, there were 32,000 people in prisons and immigrant detention centers, all across the US. So these are people that have not committed a crime. The vast majority have not committed a crime. They are fleeing violence. They are being imprisoned, right? So remember earlier we were talking about the fear of being bad. What does our country do to people that are bad or that are told that they are bad? We put them in cages. We tell them you are bad. You are not worthy. You are denied, but you're sent away. And I just wanna, we could just take a breath. These are alarming realities but it's important that we look at them because these aren't just numbers. These are real people, real people that um, have real lives, have real bonds, 
that are worthy of our attention. And I would like uh, maybe just to, um, before I give this case example, I'll stop sharing for a second. Um, any thoughts, reactions to this information? I know this is a lot. Um, it's a lot to take in. Many of you might be hearing this information for the first time. I wrote down that quote from Nayira Wahid, all the women in me are tired. It is, I'm glad you stopped us for a breath because it is, it's just heartbreaking and overwhelming. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And noticing if we just pause and notice what's happening in our body, just saying these things out loud, I feel hot, like I feel hot. I just want you to notice what sensations you're feeling. What does your body recoil from? What does your body want to do? And notice even just hearing the stories, right, of these realities causes that response in our bodies. It is by design to engender that fear response in our bodies. Any other thoughts, reactions? I, I would like to share um, how you you spoke to, you know, when the mom is pregnant of that, what the child, you know, the, the, the pregnancy and the baby are going through. But again, as adults, when they're immigrating to a new um, country, I, I really looked at that, you know, um, comparing both. And it's like, wow, I was like, wow, that is so true. And it even triggers a lot of my own things, you know, um, immigrating to this country. And um, I, as well as Susan, I did, you know, I love that quote, right? Um, All the women in me are tired. Um, and this is just me. And I think about like my mom, my grandmother, her parents, right? Um, and and just by looking at these numbers and then this app, I had no clue, Monica, honestly, I had no clue about this. And it just infuriates me. And I think about these families wanted to come here for a better future for their children, right? And uh, I just, you know, it just takes me back. My, I, I grew up with a single parent and just, just to know that that was her goal, protecting her children, giving them a better future. And um, I think about, again, those children that are in prison. I think about these moms that are pregnant in this, in, in those type of environment. And so, yes, it does. Yeah, I'm, I'm very just disgusted because we're in a country that I know, um, you know, freedom of speech and it, it's, it's, we have so much opportunity and we do have the space for these families. So yeah, <laughs> it just takes me and I could go on and on. So I'm going to stop because, but I thank you for giving us that space to breathe because yeah, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot to hold. And, and, and again, you know, our, our work that we're doing that we provide for families that have children under five, this is all toxic, toxic stress, right? Mm -hmm. That we bring from so long. And then now we pass this to our children and the, yeah. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Aurora. And thank you for making those connections. And I think a lot of us right now, even if you do not have a direct memory or connection to this information, it again causes that trauma response in our bodies because we are humans. We are whole humans. The carne y hueso of meat and bones. Um, so maybe this would be a good time just to reorient yourself to where you are. So look behind your shoulder, look at the corner, the room that you're in, remember where you are. Look at the door. Where's the door in the room that you're in? Yeah, just remember where you are. Remember who you are. 
right, right here. We're doing this work together. Mm, thank you all. Thank you so much for sticking with it, for allowing yourself to feel. Again, remember trauma, just like white supremacy culture is a project of trauma wants us to disconnect, to isolate, to feel fragmented. But institutionalized depression wants to keep us displaced in disconnection. Healing is about reconnection. So we have to reconnect to the feeling, to our bodies, to each other. And I hope we can do, we're doing that here today. Um, and as I was saying, you know, this is, these aren't just numbers. These are real people. These are our people. Um, but I want to share um, a family that um, I care about very much, Sonia, um, who I worked with for two years. Um, and so this is a kind of, we love genograms. I like genograms. It could be a little confusing. Circles mean it's a, it's a woman or woman identified. Um, square means a man or male identified. Um, and Sonia here, um, I'm, and she, you know, gave me permission to be able to share her story um, with you all to help um, educate folks about these intersections, right, between trauma that happens during pregnancy, perinatal development, and also migration trauma. So I also want to honor and thank Sonia and her family um, for trusting me with their story. Um, Sonia, when, um, when I met her, um, she had just arrived uh, to the U.S. and had just given birth um, to a baby boy um, and was having a lot of trouble connecting to him. He had a lot of big behaviors. Um, he was hard to soothe. Um, he had feeding challenges and she would just lose it on him. Like she would yell at him and she's just like, I don't want to be like this with my baby, but there's something wrong. There's something wrong. I feel I can't have trouble connecting to him. Um, and that's why she came to us for help. Um, and when, um, and so Sonia, when she was um, a little girl, she was from a Central American country um, that um, was very important to her and her family. So she grew up in a little pueblo, it was like very, very country, um, you know, a little more isolated, remote. Um, and she, you know, was raised in a multi-generational home with her mother, her father, her grandparents. Um, and when Sonia was just five years old, um, her mother and her father separately at different times uh, had to leave. They immigrated to the US. Um, and Sonia was left under the care of her maternal grandmother. Um, and while she was under the care of her maternal grandmother, so mind you, she was five years old, separated from both of her parents. This is um, something that we see a lot um, because of circumstances. Um, and when Sonia was um, about 16 years old, um, she was uh, sexually assaulted by a man in the community, and that sexual assault result resulted in a pregnancy. And in the country that Sonia is from, it, not only are um, abortions illegal, but if you it is, but if they find out that you had a miscarriage, even um, you could be imprisoned. So not just abortions are illegal, but even if you have a miscarriage, um, you may go to jail um, if they find out. Um, and so Sonia had to make a very difficult decision of what to do. She was scared. She didn't, her, her family was very religious. Her community was very religious. Um, and she made the very difficult decision to come to the U.S. pregnant um, by herself to reunite with her mother, who she hadn't seen, um, who she hadn't seen in well over 10 years, right? She, was, she left when she was five and she was 16 now. Um, and so um, on her journey, um, Sonia came in a group um, and they spent some time, um, you know, in the lab in the camps along the border before she was able to cross. And when she went, when she was able to cross, um, she was apprehended um, this was way before the CBP-1 app. Um, she was apprehended and then was in immigration detention for over a month. So at that point, she was about seven months pregnant. Um, and was in detention um, with other supposedly youths. Um, and during that time, I asked her, you know, what her experience was like, como te atendieron, like, did they, did you get access to like the care that you need? Um, and she said that any time that she had to go to an appointment or that something was wrong with her, she would tell them. Um, sometimes she would be ignored, but um, on one occasion she was put in shackles on her hands and her feet and was taken to a bus and then taken to uh, a medical provider um, who was able to attend to her because she was having some bleeding. Oh, I don't know what I did. Um, and, oh, sorry. 
And so that was sort of um, Sonia's experience of the care that she got um, in while she was in detention. After about a month um, of her family advocating, trying to get her out, and she was finally released um, back into the care of her, her mother. Um, and, um, and during, if you can imagine, after almost 10 years apart, that reunification was really difficult, really difficult. At one hand, she was relieved to see her and be reunited. But on the other hand, there was a lot of resentment, a lot of sadness. You are not, for her mother as well as for the daughter, you are not the little girl that I left. You are not the mother I imagined you to be. Um, and so there was a lot of conflict um, in their relationship. And Sonia felt very alone and unsupported, um, very stressed. And she was still um, fighting her her asylum case, right? She qualified for asylum, right? She was the the target of, a, of um, gender-based violence in a country that wouldn't provide her the protections that she needed. Um, but she was always constantly afraid that she was going to be sent back. And then what would happen to her? What would happen to the baby? Um, Sonia ended up um, going into preterm labor um, and uh, gave birth um, to Luisito prematurely. Um, and um, there was a lot of a lot of challenges with him being premature, right? He was more dysregulated. His lungs weren't fully developed. He had trouble feeding. And most importantly for Sonia, it was really difficult for her to feel connected to the baby, to look the baby in his face. Every time that he would cry, or you know how babies sometimes will try to grab at you, or when they're trying to feed or they bite, especially if you're trying to breastfeed, um, it was very, um, very scary for her, very alarming. Um, all of the ways that that baby reminded her of the sexual assault. Um, and similarly feeling alone um, in, in her relationship with her mother. So I pause there, that alone, it's a very, very difficult situation. But if we take a step back and think about what is the legacies, what are the legacies of unmetabolized fears in Sonia's story? If we didn't take the time to look at that Sonia was not the only person that was the victim of sexual assault in her family, but also Sonia's mother was a victim of sexual assault um, in her history. And could it be that maybe, and Sonia always described that, you know, even when my mom, when I was little, I never felt that close to her never felt like she responded to me or like loved me. Like I always blame myself that she left. Um, and could it be that maybe that legacy of her mother's history of sexual assault was getting in the way of their relationship? Could it be that Sonia maybe in some ways reminded her of that time in her life, right? Um, and again, that's not also not just Sonia, Sonia and her mother. Let's think about her mother's mother. Right. Sonia grew up seeing violence between her mother and her father. That's partially why they separated, partially why both of them fled. Um, and also Sonia's mother also grew up seeing violence, right, in her in her home, but not just in her home, but also in her community. So let's not just think about what has happened to Sonia, but what has happened to her people. Sonia was the first generation that was, well, the second 1.5 generation that was born after a 12-year civil war. A 12-year civil war that massacred thousands of indigenous people in her country. And especially those that were organizing around like labor rights and land rights and keeping their families together. Um, and their family um, was um, one of the few survivors of a massacre that massacred an entire village. So her grandmother and her mother were the survivors of that, one of some of the survivors of that massacre. And so then we see, right, how these legacies of violence, of survival, how might they be showing up in the violence we see in intimate partner violence? How might those legacies of violence, sexual assault has always been a weapon of war? Could it be that that sexual assault that Sonia's mother and Sonia experienced could be a legacy of that? Right? And how are these unmetabolized, unprocessed, Fears that you're going to leave me. Fears that my body will be hurt and not respected. Fears that these all these things happen to me because there's something bad or wrong with me are amplified at a collective scale, but manifest at a relational and our most intimate relationships. And so in the same way, that we have the first 
second, third, and what quote unquote fourth trimester of pregnancy, we can also layer on these stages of immigration trauma that we were talking about. So in the same way that when Sonia was in her pre-migration trauma stage, she had a fantasy, not just of who her baby was going to be, but she had a fantasy of what life was going to be in the U.S., what my life was going to be like when I reunited with my mother. So the fantasy baby of who her baby's going to be existed alongside the fantasy of me, who I'm going to be in the future. And in the same way that the fantasy baby turns into a symbolic baby, when we attribute the movements, the realities, the material conditions of what this, what this journey is turning out to be, that's different than the fantasy, parallels exactly to how the reality of coming to this country, coming face to face with those material conditions, those militarized borders, those circumstances, also takes us further away from the fantasy and closer to the conflict that the fantasy and the reality might be very different. And in the same way that Sonia was getting ready to meet the real baby in the third, her third tri trimester and trying to grapple with the possibility that my fantasy, what my life's gonna be like in the US, and the reality of what it's gonna be to be pregnant and about to have my first baby while I'm reuniting, reuniting to my mother, we're all coming together around this period. And in the fourth trimester is the period where we can expect that, that process to happen where we are getting ready to meet the real baby, right? It's all about meeting the real baby. The fantasy baby will always exist in our minds and hearts, but we're getting ready to meet the real baby in the same way that in the fourth stage of migration trauma, we have a period of overcompensation and then decompensation and then transgenerational conflict. Did we not also see a similar parallel to the postpartum period? So we can see how these ghosts of these unmetabolized fears, anxieties, affect of the perinatal period of the migration trauma context then get amplified during that perinatal period, right? So those fears of survival, will we survive? The fears of identity and role transitions, um, and the, the fears of the re-emergence of those deeply embedded psychological processes are exacerbated by conditions that confirm those fears. And so that, my friends, is when we talk about ghosts in the borderlands, we're talking about what happens when you have an entire people, like Sonia, like her mother, like our mothers, that have been told and have been shown that your bodies will be harmed, you will be separated. And all of these things are happening because you are bad. So we view you and your people as bad, that there's something wrong with you. And so in the same way that we know that the ghosts in the nursery are the unmetabolized, unprocessed fears and feelings from the mother's past, that if are unconnected, unprocessed, are more likely to be repeated. How do we think about us as a community having these unmetabolized, unprocessed? Remember that fear, that heat we were all feeling? I was just looking at the numbers. That's what that is. Those are the ghosts in the borderlands coming to tell us that I, we are afraid. These conditions are telling us, are poking and trying to confirm those core fears. And so we have a choice to make as a people. Will we continue to be fragmented? displaced and disconnected? Or can we slowly, intentionally, lovingly, gently pivot back towards reconnection? And we are also not just our ghosts, we are also angels. So um, Alicia also talks about how we can't talk about the ghosts without also remembering the angels. Sonia's story is not just one of trauma. It's not just one of pain. Um, Sonia and her people um, are so much more than the things that have happened to them. And when I asked Sonia as part of our treatment together, was there ever a time that she felt safe, connected, held? And if it was, and angels aren't people just in the same way ghosts aren't people, but it's the feeling of feeling held and safe and important. And she said that she had, she had a really hard time, but the thing, the memory that finally came to her was being in the mirpa, and uh, Amirpa is kind of like a communal farmland um, in her in her old pueblo with her grandmother and picking the corn off of the stock and holding it in her hand and knowing that she was in the right place, that she was where she was supposed to be, that they had enough. It wasn't a lot, but they had enough. 
but that reconnecting to that way of being with the land and with each other made her feel held. It wasn't a person. It wasn't a, it wasn't a special hug or a special event, but it was the feeling of being connected with land, spirit, and each other. Yeah. And so oftentimes when we hear about angel stories or what are the angels in our lives and our legacies, it's important that we think about when were the times when we felt connected to land, to spirit, to our bodies and each other, and how can we derive strength from those body memories that also exist alongside the ghosts. And as I've been saying, healing and reconnection are about connection with the self, with the self, self with community, and self with land and spirit. And I see, and I like to put this video here of the weaving work, because healing work is weaving work. We're weaving together generations. We're weaving together different forms of knowledge, different ways of being with our bodies and with each other. And the most beautiful things that I see that are woven together have a diversity of materials and they take a lot of time and patience. And I think, let me pause there before we start talking about RJ and how we heal, but any thoughts or reactions to Sonia's story, the ghosts in the, in the borderlands, how these core fears are exacerbated at a collective scale by these conditions of the immigration industrial complex. I'd like to go. Um, hello, everyone. It's kind of so. My family moved here when I was about ten years old, and that was seventeen years ago. So everything you're describing in this presentation is very, I feel like, still very recent for me. Um, what we went through, and this kind of sheds some light for me with the relationship I have with my mom. And it helps me have empathy for her because I am a mom myself now, but God knows the kind of decisions she had to make, you know, for us to get to where we are. So I really do appreciate this presentation. Thank you for sharing it. Mm, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Lida. And thank you for sharing your story with us too. Any other thoughts, reactions, questions? Can I share something too? Mm -hmm. So um, I have a similar story, not like all what you went through, but also uh, my parents made a decision to move here um, 19 years ago and came as a teenage. And like, I am doing what, um, uh, what is her name? Sonia, knitting, but it's a different thing. So that helps me. And that reminds me um, when I used to, when I was in my country. So all the time, like Monday through Friday, that's our job. And now I'm making it because it's like reminding me how I grew up, where I came from and what I went through while we crossed the border. So thank you for sharing. And wow. yeah, thanks. Thank you, Carmelina. Thank you for sharing. I would like to make a comment um, and reflecting. Thank you for everything that everyone is bringing. It's beautiful to hear the stories um, and reflecting about the word artesano in Spanish. Um, I think a lot about how uh, it's connected in some ways uh, about how healing happens when the arts uh, are happening and how it's, I just find it's a beautiful way of thinking about it. And so I just wanted to add that. Yes, thank you for bringing that that piece in Alicia how um, artesanía, ancestral ways of creating um, the arts is also how we heal, right? So um, what are those collective wisdoms that we can tap into that will bring us closer to that reconnection where we can weave in those fears and metabolize them in the act of reconnecting and creating? Yeah. Um, Thank you all for those reflections. I'm so moved um, and grateful for your vulnerability. Um, and so now let's bring into that, you know, if healing is about that reconnection, 
to to self with self, self with the land, self with the community. Um, we don't have when we see a, a shattered vase, right? That is all fragmented. We don't have to put the pieces back together in the same way that they were before. We can glue them back in a different way. We don't have to, as we are doing this work of reintegrating and reconnecting, we can weave things together differently. So that way the same story, the same fears, the same conditions don't keep getting repeated. And that's what I love about reproductive justice and migrant justice and weaving that in to this healing work that we do during the perinatal period. Um, because it's not just about our individual accountability or our collective accountability to taking care of birthing bodies and the babies, but it's also about how, about how do we change the structures? So that way birthing bodies and babies and families get what they need. Racist apps recognize all faces and they all get an equal opportunity to come across, right? How do we change the systems and create um, conditions where people have the right to not have a child if they don't want to, like Sonia did not want to have a child, right? But she wasn't allowed to. Uh, where people have the right to have a child if they want to, and the right to parent their children in safe and healthy environments, right? And this is an international struggle, um, but that was born here um, by brilliant Black activists here in the United States and particularly in the South. And there are some guide ropes from collective healing that we can learn from reproductive justice and healing justice and weave that in to our work if we work in the perinatal or mental health or social services field. And what those people teach us is that the first thing in these, again, we weave them together. They might not go in this order, but the first thing's first, we stop the violence. We stop the violence in all of its forms. We respond to the harm. When the fear that your body will be damaged is not responded to or reacted to by the collective, it sends a message, right? That impacts how we see ourselves and others. And that's what gets passed on, right? So first thing we want to do is stop the violence. Um, and then the next thing we do, and maybe not in that order, is we come back to the present moment. So notice when we were talking earlier, I had folks look around, look at all four corners, look at the door, right? Um, trauma disconnects, systems of oppression displace us from our lands, often displace us from the present moment because we're so busy trying to survive. Coming back to the present moment is also a form of healing as much as it is a form of resistance. And then finally, with those things help us create conditions that allow for deep healing. And the conditions that allow for deep healing we'll talk about more soon, but that deep healing happens in relationship. Trauma happens in relationship, healing also happens in relationship. So integrating perinatal mental health work with the migrant justice movement will require us to take some of the things we already know how to do in the therapeutic relationship and social services spaces and amplify it on a collective scale. Um, our voices are much stronger when they are together, right? Um, so the first thing that we can do that we already practice as perinatal mental health providers is speaking the unspeakable. So that's a very CPP term that we use in our program. Um, but really what it's talking about is that we must not shy away from putting language to what has happened to us what has happened to our people, what has happened to the families we work with. Um, it's often one of the first things that we talk about in therapy is what has happened, what needs to be named, and what are the, some of the harder painful dynamics that needed to be named. With Sonia and her mother, one of the unspeakables was that of the war that was never spoken about, right? What is the unspeakable there about the atrocities of the war? that then impacted how they related with one another. And so we can think about what are the unspeakables in our communities for our people. Um, so naming and, or, and organizing to stop the violence in all its forms requires us to name it first. It has to be named. In the same way that we named here today all the problems with the CBP-1 app. Um, the other piece here is remembering and connecting to, remembering and reconnecting to emotions and to each other. So embodiment, embodying, all of the parts of ourselves that have been disorganized, the disequilibrium, right? So remembering not just what happened to us, to us, but reconnecting to the affects, all of those feelings, all of the fears that if, if left unmetabolized, if left unseen, unheard, unfelt, are more likely to be replicated. It is hard, painful work. You ever poke yourself with a needle? If you ever try to sew something, it hurts. It hurts. And yet, the risk 
of not connecting with those affects, not connecting with the full experience of our humanness, not will make us less able to connect with the full experience of the joy, the love, the laughter, the positive emotions that also are here for us to connect with and experience. Remember and reconnect to emotions so we can remember and reconnect to each other. And all of these things have to happen in restoring safety in relationship to ourselves and in relationship to others. So none of these things will be possible outside of safe relationships. So how can we create conditions where the relationships that we are investing in, that are investing in us, feel safe, feel authentic? Any other thoughts? How the therapeutic work, social services work, connecting people to resources is in line. Is in line with the work of migrant justice, with healing justice, reproductive justice. Things that you're already doing. Weave it in. I know y'all are all hard workers out there. We do a lot. We go above and beyond for our people. What I'm thinking about is um, rhythmicity, consistency, right? That we keep showing up for ourselves and each other. All of those things help also reprogram our brains and our bodies, creating that rhythm, that rhythmicity. But if you think of more, put them in the chat. Because lucky for you, I have more. But it's, um, but if you have some, please share them because I don't know everything. Uh, we are all teachers here. Um, so here are some kind of what I call therapeutic guide posts. So these are kind of little posts we can put in the earth to guide us, right? We might deviate from it. There might be others we add to it. Um, but there are certain things that we can do during the perinatal period. So if we find ourselves working with someone or coming across someone that might have this unique um, presentation, unique, not so unique presentation of trauma during pregnancy, but also the trauma of migration during pregnancy. Um, and this is, can apply also to people with any histories of migration trauma. Um, first thing is noticing feelings in the moment. So giving space to notice, name, allow them to be seen. Um, meet them when they are and be in the moment with them. Yes, Aurora, that is extremely important. Um, finding connections between experiences, right? That's another really important thing that we do is we help sit with people and help them um, be able to find a connection. Between, could there be something connected between the trouble that you're having connecting with your baby and that sexual assault that you just told me about? How might those things be connected? If, Of course, if they see them, right? Or if we see it in ourselves. Building intergenerational relationships, right? Um, trauma and system, systems of oppression disconnect us. Healing is about reconnecting across generations, right? So if it's safe to do so, um, building those intergenerational relationships. Um, we talked a little bit about speaking the unspeakable, but a big one I want to talk about is remembering the suffering under the rage. Remember the grief under the rage. Oftentimes we, um, in this work, come across people, even within our own families and communities, that have a lot of rage. And um, Ken Hardy, is it Ken Hardy? Ken Hardy or Reza Menik, and one of them says that um, rage is just seasoned anger. It's just anger that has had time to fester into season. Um, and in our work in perinatal and infant early childhood mental health, we also think about how um, that underneath that rage might be, there might be some unmetabolized, unprocessed sadness, grief, loss, fears, those fears we're talking about earlier that are manifesting as rage. So how can we create conditions for that grief to be seen? Um, we want to encourage hope and connecting to ancestral wisdom. I think Alicia gave us a beautiful example of that, of connecting to our ethnicities, whatever that means for you and your people. How do your people heal? How do your people come together? How do we metabolize? Do we sing? Do we rock? Do we hum? Do we go to the park and do a carne asada? Like, what is it for you and your people? The revolution will also be joyful. The healing can also be joyful. Um, let's also be the bridge, right? Connecting, be that bridge that connects folks together, connecting folks to services, connecting folks to communities, um, to chosen family. Yeah. And then finally is um, reflecting, enhancing reflective capacity. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means. Um, 
reflective oh, reflective capacity is how we heal um, alongside the families that we work with and how we resource ourselves for this very taxing work of metabolizing ghosts and making room for angels. And so reflective capacity is something that we do to notice the impact of our past. And I think we've been doing it here today on the present. And if we do that for ourselves, we can also support the people we work with, notice how their past experiences impact themselves in the present as they transition to becoming a mother and as they transition to getting to meeting the real baby, right? Um, but it is a parallel process. We gotta do our work alongside them, y'all. It's not, it's not a one-way street. It's not a one-way street. Um, another thing that we can do to enhance reflective capacity during pregnancy is acknowledging the baby's presence, that the baby has their own memory and experience of all these things that have happened. And just be curious. I wonder what it was like for Luisito when you were in that bus and you were shackled in your hands and your feet and you were going to that appointment. I wonder how his body felt that. Or I wonder what it was like for Luisito when um, when he met his abuelita for the first time, right? After you guys were reunited, just be curious that he's he was his own little human with his own experiences. And can we create a little more space to recognize the babies and their own um, so, sort of autonomy and lived experience of all of this, right? That's already creating a new experience for them than what we had. Um, can we also reflect on also their experience as valid and real that like, wow, he, they the baby's in distress, they are hurting. And can we hold their distress as real? That babies have real pain, babies have mental health, right? And so as much as we hold the birthing people and the mothers and the caregivers and the people that surround them, can we also hold the baby and hold their feelings and their experience with just as much regard and just as much importance? And for all of us, demonstrating our awareness of who we are, who are our people, what are our practices of collective healing as someone that works with this population, right? That is a huge part of this as well. And I think we've been doing a lot of that here today. Decolonizing th therapy, yes, see that Sandra. Um, yes, absolutely. And everyone I think that might have different definitions of that, but um, but I think it's it's an important goal that we hold. Um, so I want to share this letter as we end here today um, from a woman of this from this campaign that we did called Querida America um, back in 20, 20, 2020, 2021 um, for the families that are that were at the border camps in Matamoros. Um, and I'll read it to you. I'll translate it in real time in English. Um, this woman said, um, I would like to ask the president and the government if they could please stop the violence in Mexico, in my country, and for the United States to please stop the deportations and the separation of families. I have two daughters in Michigan. One of them is 13 years old and one of them is 12. And my biggest dream is to be with them, to return to them. Now that it's been two years that I was deported and separated from them. I'm eight months pregnant and I would like to have my family reunited so that my daughters can, because my daughters need me and their dad to be with them. And I'm here asking for asylum, trying to find refuge and fleeing from the, the crime um, that causes me a lot of fear. Um, and I, I'm very scared to bring my daughters into this violence. And I'm scared of the insecurity for here that would be real for them if they came back. Thank you so much for your help. God bless you. I really hope she made it. So now I want us to just marvel at these redwood trees. You know, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen redwood trees recently, but you know they live in little families, like little circles. And that's like kind of their little family. Um, and they all have this intricate way of connecting at their roots and communicating with each other. So even if there's a wildfire or something happens, they communicate to all the other ones. Right. In the same way that we pass down what is remembered, it's not just about fear, but it's also about survival and sharing resources. And um, Leva Chavez says that the revisioning of history is una gran limpia, is a big clearing. So when we revision our history, revision our communities, it's a way of clearing out and making way for the new. Um, and so I want us to just take a moment and just imagine a society where the needs of pregnant people 
children and their families are generously met and where the idea of tearing children from their families as a way to care for them is laughable. This is a vision for a safer society without family policing, and it's not a pipe dream or an academic fantasy pie in the sky or a revolutionary utopia, but we can imagine confidently a society that has no need for family policing because we are already creating it. That's a quote by Dorothy Roberts. And so I want us to just take a moment and just visualize our work here today, all the internal work that you've been doing, all of the listening, the integrating, the examples, and all the work that you did to get here to this point on this Wednesday morning, as if it were completely successful. Never is that way, but let's just imagine for a second it was. What changes because of our work? What becomes more possible? What is no longer allowed? And how does it feel to be in that world? And that's a reflection by Adrian Marie Brown. Sorry, I don't have the citation on here. But how does it feel to be in that world? Even just saying that out loud, I notice my shoulders drop. Just imagine for yourself. Here's some books oh, that I'd like to share with you all that um, I based a lot of this workshop on that I continue to learn from. These are great resources. Take a screenshot. We'll also put them in the resource folder. Um, all these are wonderful um, for that weaving work that we're doing here together. Um, you want to learn about perinatal mental health and how to support pregnant people make room for baby is a great resource. Um, has great case examples um, that integrate the migrant justice lens with um, the perinatal healing. And all of these books, I derive a lot of wisdom from, and they're from different disciplines, right? And so I encourage you to also put, if you have any books or resources in the chat that have helped you along this journey, please, please share them with us. And finally, Miriam Kava says, I let this moment radicalize you rather than lead you to despair. And to radicalize just means getting to the roots right? Let it mobilize you. Let it inspire you to change the fabric of society. And I want to thank you all. Um, I want to leave it some time for Q&A. Um, I'm so grateful to those that shared for your presence. Um, and I'll, I'll give us just a few minutes for discussion. Um, please use this QR code and take my survey. We will be sharing one soon. Um, but I do take your feedback very seriously. And first, I will send out a survey as well, but mine is very quick. Um, I say, I say, Deborah. I'll just put my feedback link in the chat if the QR code doesn't work. Um, but all, any thoughts, questions, reactions? Thank you all. Orlando? Yeah, I think it was a, a great presentation. I like how y'all presented it, broke it down. What really turned me on was like, y'all doing it not just for a check, but y'all doing it to really help people and give people the resources. People just didn't get on a Zoom call just to get that four or five hours or a couple hours for their job. We're really going to take this information, go back to the community and really help them. So that's what made it very interesting. Wow, thank you, Orlando. That means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you so much for that feedback. Thank you all, everyone. I love seeing the chat. Also here for you know if you have any questions, thoughts, um, anything that didn't work for you, I really do encourage you to name that in the survey or if you want to discuss it now. Um, maybe I will um, stop sharing, give us give us just a couple minutes of FaceTime. Thank you, uh, Monica. This was wonderful. I mean, um... I'm speechless. Thank you. It's yeah. And, and so I was wondering if I may have your contact. 
<laughs> oh yes i can put that in the chat for everybody thank um, you yes thank no, you so nice to meet you aurora thank you for everything you shared and contributed and keep up your passion for our people for you know everyone thank you thank you thank you igualmente Um, if there's no other questions or comments or um, feedback, I just really want to take this moment to say thank you, Dr. Noriega, for being with us today and for this partnership, our Aparicio with you know, UCSF Center of Excellence. Um, we do appreciate this ongoing partnership. And you know, thank you again and for engaging um, all the audience um, in today's presentation. Um, again, uh, we have the link in the chat uh, for the materials presented today and information. And um, and just a friendly reminder to keep an eye out on um, the survey. Um, we do welcome your feedback and appreciate your time in filling that out. So thank you everyone for your time um, and look forward to seeing you in our future uh, trainings. Have a nice day. Thank you, everybody. I'll stick around for a few more minutes. Thank you for your feedback. <laughs>